for a good while and always referred to as my youngest student. Uh, she was genuinely my youngest and indeed my first student some decades ago uh, when I was her senior honors thesis advisor once upon a time at an institution far away. She was in those days a prodigy both for age and for intelligence uh, and she remains a prodigy, I guess I have to say at least for intelligence uh, in, uh, in that regard. Um, she did her undergraduate degree at Bryn Mawr, PhD at uh, Cornell University uh, with some very distinguished medievalists. She has been at Colorado College in Colorado Springs for many years, um, a distinctive and very scholarly and very interesting undergraduate institution uh, that we should all know about and praise. Um, she has worked in all that time uh, chiefly for her scholarly purposes in medieval spirituality and some other dimensions of medieval life. Her particular expertise is in the history of the Premonstratensian Order, uh, the canons regular of Premontre, who are sort of, she would correct me on this, but something like siblings, cousins, friendly relations of the Cistercians from about the same period, uh, order founded in about 1120. Um, she has written and published several books in that sphere, uh, most notably a translation and commentary on the work of Anselm of Hubbelberg, of the Premonstratensian, who was explaining at some length exactly how to get things right between the Greek and Latin churches. Uh, that project of getting things right between the Greek and Latin churches continues, and there are hopes of success. She's also worked in areas involving the medieval family, and a particular pleasure is her first book, which was a translation and commentary on the manual for <coughs> William by the great Carolingian lady Duoda. Uh, and it's one of the interesting early medieval books uh, by a female author and prescribing conduct for a, at that point to her, because he was her son, uh, somewhat at least subservient, uh, somewhat subservient. Uh, she's been a distinguished member of the Colorado College community for many years. She has escaped service as chair of the Department of History on repeated occasions, uh, which means she's not always escaped, uh, but she is admired and respected by generations of her students some of whom are now themselves in quite distinguished professions and academic positions around the world. So, Carol, welcome to Arizona State, um, and we look forward to hearing you tell us about your demons. Thanks, Jim, for that very kind introduction. What he didn't say is that if I'm wrong here, it's his fault, because he taught me how to do these things. <laughs> But thank you all for coming. I'm talking about something quite different today, as the title suggests, from the sorts of work which Jim describes as central to my history. Um, in fact, I should tell you that an earlier version of this project was initially prepared for a meeting of psychiatrists. So you will have to see how it plays with people who are interested in the Middle Ages more than they are in psychiatry, properly speaking. My topic is demons, sorrow, and charity. Religious communities in the Middle Ages pose a potentially fruitful challenge to modern response to mental illness. Investigation of the utility of historical exemplars, however, requires consideration of both social contexts and belief structures surrounding <coughs> afflicted medieval persons. In a society in which village life was normative, in which the mentally ill were less marginalized or separated from ordinary sociability than in modern medicalized situations, and in which visions and voices were sometimes seen as evidence of proximity to the divine. Were men and women seen fundamentally differently from how they are viewed today? Did medieval communities enable recovery and welcome the return of persons on whom modern society might finally give up? Or conversely, were medieval suffering from what we today label major mental illnesses more frequently treated as satanically affected, hence met with greater reprobation or fear than in modern society? Answers to these questions are generally assumed with little reference to medieval practice. The present study introduces a slim, rich category of evidence from monastic records about management of mental illness into a scholarly conversation driven more by modern historiographical paradigms than historical reality. 
The historiography of medicine generally understands medieval approaches to mad men and women to have been determined by belief in the supernatural. In the English-speaking world in particular, moderns view the Middle Ages through the lens of Bedlam. They understand the presence of the mentally ill in England and on the continent in the period before the foundation of the great London Bethlehem Hospital as resolved in early modern voyeurism and bestialization of the psychologically deviant. Meanwhile, since the 1960s, the long shadow of Michel Foucault's Histoire de la Folie has fallen heavily on the field of study of historical psychopathology. Foucault's contention that early medieval benignity toward the mentally aberrant was darkened in analogy to the social exclusion of the later Middle Ages lepers remains an unresolved dialectic with the medical historical model. More recently, feminist historiography has focused on the attribution of visionary experience in other cultural contexts and indeed in some medieval circumstances seen as illness or divine enlightenment as accounted in much of the European past to demonic possession, a condition in which many more medieval women than men were categorized. All three of these scholarly perspectives characterize historical explanations of mental deviance more than responses by sufferers, companions, and communities. Among scant documents for actual treatment of, medieval, of, of mental illness in medieval Europe, monastic records are relatively abundant, reflecting the charge to tend the sick in these institutions' foundational texts. The Acts of the Apostles mandated care for the weak and the infirm, while the Gospel accounts of Jesus' life repeatedly portray him as tending the, to the poor, sick, and unfortunate, including the demonically possessed, even when this engagement markedly violated cultural conventions. Scriptural and later patristic, theologically authoritative texts shaped institutional development towards support of persons suffering from all manner of sickness as a special responsibility of intentional Christian communities. Particularly influentially, the rule of St. Benedict, the primary behavioral and organizational code of Western monasticism throughout the Middle Ages, urged hospitality broadly understood as receiving every stranger as Christ himself, as the text says. Benedict's injunction undergirded the European Church's long-standing commitment to social and hospital work, including the care of the mentally ill. The present study begins to frame a description of a specifically monastic management of response to mental illness, especially with respect to the lay brothers and sisters who lived around the reformed religious communities of the 12th and 13th centuries. Lay associates, identified in Latin primary sources as conversi and conversi, literally those who were converts, people who had turned to religious life, in monastic houses and their dependencies, represent a social and ritual marginality in rough aspect analogous to psychological liminality. Their presence was new in the European 12th century despite the already 500-year continuity of Benedictine monasticism across the continent as the principal vehicle of cultural unity from Hungary to Ireland and Sicily to Scandinavia. Religious communities spreading out from central Italy to the north and west after the 6th century had traditionally depended on the agricultural labor of serfs and the manners with which the lay nobility endowed these establishments even as the same nobles offered family members as oblates for careers of prayer and learning. Beginning in the 11th century, however, reformed monastic communities, that is, foundations purporting newly strict observance of the 6th century rule of St. Benedict or other patterns of religious observance, such as the Augustinian rule, introduced a two-tiered system of religious commitment, reducing monastic dependence on the agricultural labor of secular individuals bound to the land by servile obligation. Lay brothers and sisters, generally illiterate and usually of peasant origin, were committed to reformed religious communities as human instruments by whom choir monks and nuns, those communities' pri primary members, might be enabled to full separation from worldly entanglements, 
Even the limited engagement in religious life that Conversi achieved was enthusiastically sought out by ordinary folk in a literally and figuratively perilous age in which monastic houses formed refuges from economic insecurity and nightly violence and in which eternal salvation was ardently desired by most Europeans. The Order of Citeaux, founded in 1098, provided the primary institutional model for lay brotherhood across the subsequent medieval centuries. Cistercians cast off the black garb of traditional Benedictinism and chose white, more properly speaking, undyed, brownish, woolen habits symbolic of poverty, purity, and penance. These white monks' dress and the thoroughgoing asceticism it represented effectively reproached the social prominence, economic power, and artistic accomplishment of traditional monasticism, purporting to recall European religious life from worldly dissolution to its fundamental spiritual identity. For the Cistercians, charity, understood in the full sense of the Latin word caritas, connotation as the loving force binding community, took the place of traditional Benedictinism's emphasis on obedience as the central monastic virtue. The Cistercian's most important document of self-definition as against the black monks, their unreformed Benedictine predecessors, was titled Carta Caritatis, the Charter of Charity. The establishment, maintenance, and perfection of charity were arguably the central social and spiritual agenda of Cistercian religious houses for both men and women in the order's early development. The charity of the white monks had a far wider influence among those who direct, than, than among those who directly assumed their habit. The Cistercian abbot Bernard of Clairvaux, the most famous preacher of the 12th century and among its most broadly influential figures, represented the ritual practice moral agency and mystical piety of his order as the pinnacle of spiritual achievement, Europe generally believed him. Bernard's and his model spoke, Bernard's model spoke compellingly not only to the recruits who peopled some 600 men's communities founded from Ireland to the Slavic East before 1200, but also to the many women whose houses eventually, after much resistance from ecclesiastical authorities, were received under Cistercian governance. Still more influentially, the Cistercian model inspired not only regular religious life, that is the shape of monastic communities as those living Christianity as totally as possible, but also of the character of lay belief and observance. <coughs> the religious ethos of Francis of Assisi, the merchant's son, who became in a short lifetime 13th century Europe's most attractive spiritual model, was thus predicated by the leavening of popular piety in the 12th century Reformation, accomplished through the charismatic preaching of Bernard, his imitators, and his rivals. Lay brothers and sisters, directly associated with monastic houses that most fully expressed the 12th century flowering of spiritual life, were immediate objects of its reformation of compassion and hospitality. Conversi and Conversi became the first Europeans to experience a deepened commitment to the impoverished and the infirm as breaking the boundaries of religious life, especially in their sicknesses. Monasteries' response to mental illness among their lay associates was thus an important element in the expression of reformed medieval Christianity's maintenance not only of community well-being, or as we might say today, public health, but of its central moral character. Beginning in the early 13th century, stories of lay brothers and sisters were in large part muffled in the historical record by the tendency among Cistercians and other orders to minimize formal relationships with collateral persons. So the 12th century records best represent their experience in this as in other respects. Overwhelmingly, evidence about early Cistercian conversi and conversi survives in narrative accounts by full choir monks. Extant exempla, morally instructive stories about monastic life, were recorded about lay brothers or sisters, were recorded about lay brothers or sisters rather than by those monastic affiliates. These sources' representation of their subjects is tendentious and instructional, 
so eliding detail or reframing events as does hagiographical literature, the saints' lives from which modern historians nonetheless infer much of what is known about the practice of monastic religion or medieval ritual and spiritual life in general. At the same time, however, exempla about lay brothers, again like hagiographical accounts, often point the more exactly toward modes of perception and interpretation, the more they model accuracy in representing events, in that they reveal what a given author considered especially important and instructive. With regard to psychological and related behavioral deviance, Exempla potentially reveal expectation and interpretation while obscuring information moderns might find diagnostically significant in the representation of medical or psychological issues. These texts' rhetorical goals nonetheless to an extent enhance their expression of the ways in which historical and contemporary cultures represent and address mental illness. The present discussion approaches these records of the monastic past in awareness that their representation of the persons in whom they are most interested is self-consciously fictive, but assuming as well that some reflection of those individuals' historical experience is accessible, that in Bactinian terms, voiceless historical figures indeed find expression through the representations of elites if we look diligently for the vestiges of those subalterns' actions and intentions. It further assumes that it is possible to apprehend important features of the medieval management of mental illness without, so to speak, understanding the medieval account for mental illness. That is, my discussion notes that medieval and modern cultures alike identify as pathological, psychic traits or events perceived as damaging to bodily health or social engagement while acknowledging their etiology as mysterious or unknown. Historically discrete cultures may differ in their respective senses of the possible truth of visions or delusions, uh, uh, sorry, visions and auditory anomalies, but moderns and medievals surrounding an individual experiencing visions or delusions marshal urgent responses when such anomalies conspicuously yield physical or social difficulties for the person so affected. Bodily suffering long-standing sadness obviating normal activity, separation from community. These conditions have signaled the need for historical and contemporary cultures alike to address mental alterity. Acceptance of medieval's descriptions of behavioral anomaly and perceptions of psychic distress as indicators that monastic communities should assist sufferers, thus resist modern's characteristic impulse to clarify diagnoses of specific illnesses. Medieval texts use a broad variety of terms to suggest psychological distress. Most imply theories of a given problem's genesis, but they do so imprecisely, opening the possibility of multiple understandings. Terms of art used by monastic authors to describe mad men and women are often better left untranslated, Morbus, disease, phrenesis, madness, tristitia, sadness, achidior, arcadia, lassitude, demones, demons. All of these terms and many more are variously used to indicate states moderns might term psychosis or depression. Medievals more than moderns lacked confidence or in many instances interest in classifying these illnesses and frequently their description of behaviors resulting from what they term demonic possession are indistinguishable from behaviors they attribute to tristitia or achidia. So a binary taxonomy align, aligning the one with what moderns understand to be psychotic delusion and the other with what they know as depression strains the evidence. Happily in this study's terms, medieval's tendency, especially before the 15th century, when demonic possession became a central cultural obsession. To understand those categories loosely enables attention to the primary text generally sidestepping the major historiographical snarls. Discussion here below considers discussions of demons understood to have caused alienation alongside the more figurative demons of disabling feelings, behaviors, and perceptions, as do monastic authors. Conversi and conversi associated with medieval monasteries variously experienced these ills, and accounts of their suffering, 
and their community's attempts to help them suggest monks' and sisters' sense of appropriate care for various troubled persons. Among the most valuable sources for understanding the role of lay brothers among the 12th century Cistercians is the so-called Magnum Exordium, or Great Beginning, a chronicle and laudation of the early order written by the monk Conrad of Eberbach over the several decades between 1180 and 1215, as the Order of Citeaux slipped from its early ardor into maturity as an established network of religious communities. Magnum Exordium is unusual among monastic sources in that it blends hagiographical material, particularly about Bernard of Clairvaux, with institutional history, discussion of legislation and property management, moral exempla about different participants in Cistercian life, and information about spiritual practice. The whole is hortatory, calling its imagined readership to maintain the spiritual excellence of early Cistercian models. Substantial elements in Conrad's collection of Cistercian stories commend the spiritual stature and practical contributions to their communities of lay brothers, who were often financial managers, skilled craftsmen, and property agents, as well as shepherds and farmhands. A few of these stories take up the nexus of religious life and psychic anomaly, describing psychological disorder in different cases as on the one hand demonic possession or apparition, and on the other as sorrowful withdrawal into incommunicative lassitude. One of the exempla in Conrad's collection, entitled The Dangers of Disobedience, is particularly instructive about Cistercian practice regarding individuals separated from community participation by demonic assault. In this small tale, a lay brother at Clairvaux has experienced long-term difficulty working, participating in group activities, and even in sleeping. As the author says, he is full of rancor and bitterness and unworried about persevering in his obstinacy. Two demons appear to the troubled lay brother in the night, and as the narrator reports, presumably interpreting the sufferer's own account, argue loudly over his wakeful body marking his disobedience and deciding to toss him out of the door of the dormitory, out of the society of the obedient brothers. The demons then decide to carry the unfortunate outside the walls of the monastery and begin out of sheer malice to throw him back and forth over a marsh like a plaything. When the bell for the night office rings, the demons suddenly drop the brother and disappear. The afflicted man then takes refuge, filthy and frightened, under a bush. In the morning, some of his confreres find him and attempt to take him to the prior of their community for assistance. The victim of the demonic attack has by this point been so reduced and bestialized that he bares his teeth and threatens to bite his rescuers. They nonetheless soothe him, capture him, and carry him home. After a long stay in the monastic infirmary, the afflicted brother's sociability is restored, and he is, as the author says, cured of his disobedience. Conrad of Eberbach, the redactor of this curious tale, here wishes his monastic audience to appreciate the consequences of lapses of discipline, but the story he relates surprises the modern reader in its representation of demonic forces as in concert with social correction rather than in opposition to community harmony. Whether we understand the lay brothers' demons as vision or delusion, we realize that in the narrator's view, the supernatural figures who tormented this conversus in the night led him to a state of antisocial rage and physical degradation because he is so obstreperous but that, they, that they did not so correct his alienation. Despite the sufferer's obnoxiousness and aggression, his confreres are obliged to care for him after the demonic harrowing and take up his correction where the demons left off. Their response is neither to identify the errant brother as satanic, nor to exclude him, rather to tend him in the infirmary, where the text says, for a long time he lay, still in the same demented state, until he relearned to live in community by being surrounded by the patience and ritual life of those among whom he had in former times been a willing participant. Conrad's story about the disobedient brother beset by night frights 
suggests that the audience of monastic exempla understood demonic attack as triggered by individuals' internal psychic states and manifested in problematic behaviors. His medieval readership evidently believed that correction or treatment nevertheless might be addressed to the sufferer's apparent condition rather than to any underlying supernatural affliction. In this instance, the community who recovered the lay brother from under a bush in a bog waited out his illness and patiently, gradually reintroduced him to group activities until he regained behavioral normalcy. As narrator, Conrad expects his readers or listeners to appreciate that Christian, especially monastic virtues, are summoned and strengthened as the community of this demoniac secures his release. The monastic circle of Caritas extends to this simple, literally filthy lay brother, and by implication to a continent of poor, illiterate, and potentially demoniac Europeans, posing a model of assertive intervention, tolerance, and affirmation of community engagement toward their recovery. Cistercian religious communities, especially but not exclusively communities of women, engaged in hospital and hospice work as well as agricultural labor. The white monk Caesarius of Heistebach, whose Dialogus Miraculorum was completed before 1240, stands alongside Conrad in his exordium as among the more informative of authors on the order during its first century. Caesarius represents a relatively stronger emphasis on such charitable enterprise, with his text offering many instances of monks, lay brothers, and sisters' spiritual preferment through care of the sick. His so-called dialogue purports a conversation between a monk and a novice, in which the elder tells many stories of monastic heroism. The novice interlocutor asks thoughtful questions about these moral models, so receiving a thoroughgoing introduction to both Cistercian ideals and realities. Among the most compelling of the stories so shared by the monk and his novice pupil is a moral tale about a non-Cistercian, an unnamed bishop of Salzburg, who assiduously cares for the sick, including lepers, those sufferers from the disease of the soul whom medieval saw as expiating sins in this life and promise of salvation in the next. On one of his hospice visits, this prelate is besought by a woefully disfigured patient to bring him the Eucharist. The bishop hastens to do so, and when he does, the leper almost immediately vomits the host. The compassionate visitor takes hold of the man's chin and directly consumes the vomitus. Later, when he returns to visit the leper, he is told by the hospice staff that there has never been such a man in residence. The bishop of the story concludes that the leper was an extraordinarily palpable apparition of Christ himself. His tale lends powerful affirmation to the importance of embrace of the sick for Cistercian audiences in particular. Caesarius work, divided into 12 characteristically 13th century distinciones, or discussion topics, among which demons, visions, and miracles figure prominently, offers a perspective on mental illness informed by the charge to charity towards sick persons emphasized by the tale of the Bishop of Salzburg. His collection of Cistercian stories represents many demoniacally, demonically possessed and otherwise alienated monks, sisters, and conversi or conversi. One, a story about a secular laywoman rather than a lay sister, but clearly referring to monastic values, bears especially closely on Conrad of Eberbach's tale in Magnum Exordium of the disobedient lay brother. Caesarius represents that a noble woman possessed by demons is finally brought to a modest and holy priest by her caregivers, who have all but despaired of her cure after visiting many saint shrines. This cleric succeeds in expelling the demons, then commands her to stay in the same place for 30 days and receive the Eucharist daily. After nine days, believing the cure complete, the caregivers take the woman away prematurely. As they travel, however, a devil again seizes the woman and spins her around on the road with such violence that she falls down as if all her bones are broken, so that they are limp. As limp, Caesarius writes, as entrails. When the novice speaker of his dialogue asks Caesarius' monk interlocutor why disaster so befalls the lady, the older man answers that her fate resulted again from inobedientia, disobedience, 
This description of the moral ideology of disabling illness in a monastic context in which obedientia, obedience, is a high value, suggests that the medieval paradigm for the repair of at least some instances of mental disorder was most simply order, that the defect of participation in well-arranged religious activity was the reason for which secular persons and regular religious alike fell into psychic disarray. Caesarius offers several thematically related stories of suicides, or near suicides, a few involving lay brothers in monastic communities. In one instance, he tells of a wicked lay brother who by, he says, the practice of magic arts, led a nun to fornicate. Guilt-ridden, but unable to explain her distress to her sisters, the young woman begins to repeat to the older sisters of her house that she wants to leave the community. Then, because of her sadness, tristitia, and this gentle term is generally Caesarius' word for sorrow, disabling to the point of social retreat or self-immolation, she threw herself into a well and so died. Later, some of the sisters recalled to their dismay that the girl had previously spoken of such a situation, that she would drown myself in a well. They wished that they had taken her more seriously and explored a more forceful means to pre prevent her death. A few paragraphs later, continuing to muse on sorrow and suicide, Caesarius tells the story of a young man who hung himself. Here the interlocutors pause to inquire about what conclusions the community ought to draw from these events. Their comments speak directly to Caesarius' other accounts of despair and alienation. The younger man asks about these suicides, and what are we to understand was their soul's fate? The monk responds, if this has befallen because they suffered from sadness, tristitia, and despair, desperatia, rather than mental disorder, phrenesis, or the loss of their minds, mentis alienatio, they are certainly damned. But as for the mad, furiosi, and the idiotic, fati, in whom reason has no power, the question is not whether they have been saved, however they may have died, if only they have had charity, caritas. Caesarian speakers thus conclude that the ultimate moral state, hence the salvation or damnation of individuals, depends on their participation in the central virtue of Christian community, rather than on the circumstances to which illness or disability has reduced them. The text's elder speaker goes on to say, God may in his justice allow that some few of those who are good in heart and fear him lose their mental clarity. He says, paracletare in sensu. But he does not allow those persons to come to so wretched an end. These monastic voices speak to perceived difference between hopeless rationality and the irrationality of insanity, noting the difference and suggesting that charity is the sign of both individuals and communities' fundamental success as human souls. <clears throat> Another of Caesarea's stories of suicide in the monastic context describes the efforts of the community surrounding an eventual suicide to care for him and to prevent his death. Here Caesarea speaks from direct knowledge, averring that he will not mention names or places lest he bring distress to his immediate confreres at Heisterbach or other Cistercian communities. He tells of a, he says, brother well known to me, a man from, who from his youth to his old age had participated in religious life in a laudable way, without complaint. For some reason known only to God, he grew sad and weak-spirited, tristus et pusillanimous, so that he was overwhelmed with anxiety about his sins and despaired of his salvation, doubting not only his faith but his physical vitality. This man's confreres do everything they can to recall him to community life and restore his health, but he says, he could be lifted up by no authority of scriptures when he was in the infirmary or brought back to hope by no good example when his brothers asked, what are you afraid of? Why do you despair? He answered, I cannot say my prayers anymore in the way I used to, and I fear hell. Here the author comments, because he was struggling in this weakness of sadness, tristitia, and therefore was dulled to interest and action, achidiosus. The forces of Tristitia and Achidia made his heart hopeless. He was cared for in the infirmary, but he only gathered himself to meet his death, saying, I cannot fight any longer. But without really understanding those words, he slipped out of the monastery to the fish pond and drowned himself there. <clears throat> 
Caesarea's personal account of this brother's suicide suggests that his own was one of the voices attempting to recall the suffering lay associate from the downward spiral. His text's matter-of-factness about the community's effort literally to talk the brother out of his illness denotes familiarity with such psychological trouble and a well-accepted means of supporting an individual who has been separated from the comfort and activity of religious community. Recent scholarship has noted the functional conformity of monastic practices such as the chapter of faults in which individuals' personal and social difficulties are explored in community conversation with modern psychotherapeutic protocols. Certainly the effort Caesarius describes to support and supervise a brother who without any physical disability declines to participate either in manual labor or the community's life of prayer suggests that the psychological troubles such as this that psychological troubles such as this lay brothers were understood as illness rather than sin. Among other 12th century sources for the lives of Cistercian lay brothers of the 12th century, a unique manuscript preserved in the Municipal Library of Troyes, conventionally labeled Collectanium Clarvalense, offers further evidence for the management of Tristitia and Achidia. This collection, lightly begun during the abbacy of Clairvaux's fourth abbot, Geoffrey, a former Paris academic and close disciple of the great Bernard, offers many stories of demoniacs and others troubled by psychic ills. One example about a lay brother recounts the reaction of a community in the Diocese of Rouen to a member's combined physical collapse and psychological alienation. This man, as the text relates, continued to decline despite the close care of the monastery's infirmarian, but showed no concern for the state of his soul, refusing any fundamental sacramental support, confession, communion, or unction. In an effort to repair the sick man's isolation, the prior took counsel with his confreres about how to recover this brother, whom the text said was cut off from them, a matter which required the more thoughtful conversation because it was so unusual. In the monk's collective interpretation, forceful intervention was required lest Satan, as the text said, the arrogant, grasping destroyer of the Lord's sheep should be so bold as to seize one of them. The community decided to repair as a whole to the Abbey Church to pray for the alleviation of this conversus sorrow. Then the prior came back to visit him on his sickbed, hoping for some improvement. The brother at first refused to open his eyes. At the prelate's touch, though, he responded. When asked if he recognized his prior, the conversus answered that he did indeed, and that he had a sense of now being liberated from satanic oppression. The brother said, a little while ago, the house was filled with dark-willed spirits whose presence weighed upon my heart, pressing me down, so that I could not accept your health-bearing counsel or care about my own well-being. But now, because God is good and because those evil ones could not resist the force of your prayers, I am ready to accept your counsel. The lay brother of Rouen then willingly received the sacraments, and the text so represents him as re-entering into community life. The redactor of the Collectanium Clarvalense then steps outside his narrative to point out to his reader the significance of this small tale for the character of monastic life, writing, May that community be blessed for its charity and affection, caritas and delectio, and for its exercise of devotion and compassion, pietas and compassio. He recurs to the central Cistercian virtue charity as the binding force of the monastic fellowship. The redactor's exemplar demonstrate a charity triumphant in its ability to recall not only monks but lay brothers, not only the physically challenged, but also those who were so mentally troubled as to break sacramental bonds, all to the common table symbolic of their life together. <clears throat> John of Clairvaux, who gathered the Collectanium Clairvalense and may have been the author of the passage about the lay brother recalled to health by the prior's touch and the monk's prayers, was the exact contemporary of his master Bernard's famous female correspondent, the Rhineland polymath and self-proclaimed prophetessa, Hildegard of Bingen. Hildegard's theory of mental illness is much discussed in medical historical literature for its balanced treatment of biological, humoral, etiology, and environmental factor factors. Here, her treatment of those whose relationships and activities are interrupted by med mental disturbance speaks directly to the care by Cistercian communities for their suffering members. 
Hildegard was a Benedictine, so an abbess in a monastic affiliation in which collateral members, lay sisters in her case, were not an important and explicit part of respective houses organization. Benedictine convents of literate choir nuns, among whom Hildegard's Rupertsberg was famous, nonetheless embraced illiterate sisters whose role was closely analogous to those of conversi and Cistercian abbeys. One such sister came to Hildegard and her community directly because of that woman's psychological troubles. <clears throat> An exchange of letters in 1169 between Hildegard and the Benedictine abbot Godolphus of Brauweiler about this troubled woman draws attention to the complexity of monastic communities' response to behavioral anomalies. The abbot writes to Hildegard explicitly as the self-proclaimed voice of the living light, acknowledging that her notoriety as a visionary was on everyone's lips. He protests his confidence that given his addressee's proximity to the divine, she will be able to help a certain noble lady who has been besieged for many years now by an evil spirit. Notably, the abbot's description of the noble woman's ills offers no detail about the malign force. And as in the case in many monastic accounts of the causation of psychological difficulty, his reference to demonic possession seems virtually a dead metaphor. The afflicted noblewoman of the region of Cologne, Zygovitsa, had already suffered for seven years. The abbot states that she has been brought to him by her friends to be freed from the menacing enemy through the aid of the blessed Nicholas, our patron. Three months' effort on his and his community's part has yielded no improvement, as Godolphus says, because of our own sins. Now he asks Hildegard's counsel because, as he says, the demon, when he was conjured one day, finally revealed to us that this possessed woman could be freed only through the strength of your contemplation and the magnitude of your divine revelation. This insight likely came through the voice of the sufferer herself, expressing a desire for refuge in a women's community. Hildegard writes back to Godolphus, prescribing an exorcism of her own design, in which seven priests would surround the woman and instantiating scriptural types of priesthood from Abel to Aaron, successively demand that the demon leave the woman's body. Godolphus later informs Hildegard that the exorcism was performed as prescribed, but that it was only temporarily successful and that the demon has now declared that he will leave only if Hildegard herself expels him. A later letter from the dean of the Cathedral Church of Cologne to Hildegard thanks her for her tenacity in seeking this difficult patient's cure. The visionary abbess's response emphasizes that the woman has been returned to help, not so much by her, Hildegard's agency, as by the collective effort of all her sisters upon the patient's arrival at their convent, speaking as one through their actions and their prayers, as she says, as well as each on her own, so assisting her in every way we could. The life of Hildegard, composed in the following century at Diese Bodenburg, along with the abbess's own account, rehearses the full detail of the eventual successful ritual cleansing of the unfortunate lady at Hildegard's community. The reception of the noble woman Zygovitsa by Hildegard and her sisters resonates strongly with the testimony of parallel witnesses in reformed communities about those afflicted by demons and other mental problems. The dean of Cologne at least believes that the prayers of Hildegard's nuns and the regularity of their life have been helpful to his friend, as he says, we have recently heard that the ancient enemy has been cast out of her by your prayers. Clearly neither Hildegard nor her nuns found the reception of a demoniac so frightening or repulsive that they could not accept her. Rather, they saw Zygovitsa's entry into their community as an opportunity both to effect charity and to respond to the sick woman's wish to join them. Suggestively, Hildegard's Vita locates the account of the cure of Zygovitsa in its third and final book, immediately before a chapter discussing the abbess's own recurrent illness which her biographer notes she herself described as both physically and emotionally debilitating, but at the same time as triggering her revelations. The critical reader of Hildegard's correspondence in her medieval vita is thus challenged to compare the visionary's illness with Sigovitsa's and to wonder whether from either the epistolographer's or the hagiographer's point of view, the prayers and repeated therapeutic rituals which brought Sigovitsa back from the margins of sociability and reason 
also maintained and nurtured Hildegard in her own more culturally val valorized psychic marginality. In any case, the abbess's counsel to Godolphus and her reception of a difficult and obnoxious demoniac into her own community mirrors the content of the Cistercian records of the late 12th and early 13th century about the management of madness on the fringes of monastic community. Zygovica, like Conrad's, Caesarius, and the Cistercian collectanium, sad, deluded, and suicidal lay brothers and sisters, was met with combined patience, carefully orchestrated curative ritual, and physical attention shaped by understanding of alienation from community as determined by a combination of bodily and spiritual ills. Hildegard saw divine light. Zygovica was embraced in monastic communities. Others met with sadder outcomes, but not because the, the people around them did not see collective effort toward their recovery as a paramount expression of monastic values. <clears throat> Behind modern discussion of medieval monastic practices and the care of the mentally ill lies the enduring model of Hale. G, this is G-E-E-L, um, but we try to make the Dutch noise. That's a, a historical reality, and at the same time an ironic commentary on modern medicine's conviction that treatment is often improved by rupture with past models. Since the seventh century, this Flemish-speaking village near Antwerp has been the site of the shrine of a saint reputed to heal those afflicted by mental illness and demonic possession. Dymphna, the young Irish woman buried there, had been martyred before 600 by her incestuous father. Her relics then were sought throughout the Middle Ages by the mad or possessed, call them or, what their, con or their contemporaries, call them what their contemporaries or we will, for their curative power. By the 19th century, the village where they were buried had so well developed a system of hospitality for pilgrims who stayed on in hopes that residency would enhance an instantaneous or instigate a slow coming improvement that the Belgian government assumed its management as a tax supported facility. Today, the town remains a distinctive and powerful model of community recovery for the mentally ill having continued through and past the Middle Ages to harbor those whom medicine now labels psychotics among a normal population aware of and supportive of their difference, a system self-consciously alternative to the heavy pharm pharmaceutical management and physical confinement typically accorded these persons since the 18th century. <clears throat> Religious communities, primarily nuns trained as nurses and social workers, retained important agency in the Hale program into the later 20th century. The present study confirms that the character of these largely female health workers' engagement with the mentally ill has deep roots not only in broad ethical terms in medieval monastic tradition, but also in the social and ritual practices of 12th century communities who assumed that whatever the reasons for an afflicted person's dysfunction and alienation, primary goals in their management were to reestablish social engagement and participation in community ritual. These persons were not excluded or marginalized, even when they were seized by satanic forces. Instead, they were seen to be in need of the community's encouragement against dark forces from within or without, either demons chattering in the night or life-stealing sadness and lethargy. Accounts of monastic management of mental illness suggest that when a patriarchal church began in the 15th century to understand demonic possession as a problem, especially for women, it did so in active rejection of earlier medieval practice. In the 12th century, men had been understood to suffer as much as women from demons' humor and cruelty. Brothers, like sisters, experienced achidia and tristitia. When they did, religious communities of the High Middle Ages understood care for sufferers from what moderns label as major mental illnesses to be a central moral commitment, even or especially when those illnesses resulted in social separation, physical debility, and even lapses of hygiene. Monks, sisters, and friars would indeed build and staff Europe's first leprosaria for returning crusaders stricken by this other disease of the soul. But the midwives of Bedlam came later. The birth of the asylum was attended by early modernity's harsher exercise of the social control of suffering. <clears throat>
By the 16th century, isolation and confinement of the mentally ill had replaced the ritual and physical inclusion by which medieval religious communities judged their own success as practitioners of charity. Thanks for your attention.